and we're live in five, four, four three, two, one. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clifford Pierre. I'm one of the fellows here at Swedish Neuroscience Institute. And I'd like you to welcome you to our cerebrovascular question and answer symposium hosted by Seattle Science Foundation. This morning, we are thrilled to have Dr. Jan Carl Burkhardt, a vascular neurosurgeon at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania as our speaker. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery and Neuroradiology, currently serves as the division head of cerebrovascular and endovascular surgery at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he holds leadership roles as the director of the cerebrovascular revascularization, revascularization program, the center of excellence in uh, cavernous malformation, as well as um, the director, serves as the director of the neurointerventional fellowship program. Uh, his training uh, includes neurosurgery residency at the University of Hospital um, Zurich in Switzerland and uh, fellowships at UCSF and NYU. He's an author of numerous publications and uh, has special interest in cavernous malformations. Today, we are excited to hear his talk on integration of biplane angiography into the intraoperative setting. Thank you, Dr. Burkhardt, for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me slide my sh uh, share my slides. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. No, thank you again for having me. Um, it's really an honor and pleasure to talk today um, at the Seattle Science Foundation um, Grand Rounds. And um, when I thought about what I want to talk uh, about today, um, I, I kind of came up with the new idea of like talking a little bit about our experience integrating the bi biplane and geography into the interoperative setting, because that's what we did recently here at Penn. And I kind of want to share our experience, the opportunities, but also sometimes the challenges we have. Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, I structured the presentation first in kind of like an introduction and set up um, how, how our setup is here at Penn. And then I want to talk about kind of the biplane and 3D interoperative angiography as an adjunct for open surgery. But then also I want to focus on planned hybrid procedures. So what are potential cases we would do in a hybrid setting? But then also hybrid procedures who are unplanned. So let's say you start first um, um, with an endovascular treatment, but during the case, something happened or you realize that it's not going to go that way and you change to open either surgical bailout or you kind of change your approach. Or on the other hand, you start with an open procedure and then you realize you need something endovascular. So that's kind of the structure um, I prepared for today. And so if we start, um, is the interoperative angiography actually necessary? I mean, it's a big subject and we know there's a lot of um, literature out there. I, I always say if it's available and, and, and not too stressful for open surgeries, it, it really adds a lot of benefit, especially when you have a hybrid OR or if, if your team is routinely using it. It can be a little bit struggle some, or they, there can be some some issues if if you don't have a, have a true setup. If you look into the literature, actually here just two examples for aneurysm and AVM publications. So here a large series of 155 uh, clipped aneurysms, and you can see that in 12% of the cases um, there was uh, the intraoperative angiogram showed an abnormality. So either was it an aneurysm residual, neck residual, or apparent vessel occlusion during clipping. And you can also see that um, incomplete clipping um, predictors for that was interoperative rupture. As you can imagine, it's a stressful scenario and you quickly try to clip the aneurysm or also anterior location of the, um, of the aneurysm. Vessel occlusion was, as you can imagine, more in the posterior circulation. So for example, basilar artery clipping or where you can't see maybe the back, back end of the, the parent vessel. Um, so really in, in more deeper locations and in, in aneurysms, and I'm going to show a few examples later where you don't have a full 360 degree view of your neck, it can be very helpful for AVMs for sure. It's, it's very useful after resection to make sure you have the full nidus. And here's just a small study from our uh, pediatric colleagues here at CHOP in Philadelphia, who looked into 21 cases where even in these small series, two cases showed a residual which prompted further resection during the surgery. 
But is intraoperative angiogram equals intraoperative angiogram? So they're different systems. Um, and you can think about the most, the simplest thing to do an intraoperative angiogram is with like a mobile C arm, or you can have more fixed system, for example, a, rob a robotic arm um, or true biplane. And the more advanced the technology goes and the more um, larger your system is, the more you can do with it. And obviously, um, you can with a biplane or or um, also a robotic C arm. You can you can get these very pretty images, like three D images, fused images, or dynasties, um, as you can see here. Either like as an example for a spinal dorsal fistula or a post intrasecular here contour um, embolization. Um, and then the question is always when you have these machines, what is what is your angiography setup in your hospital? And you can either have completely separate um, setups. So you, on the left side, you can see two IR um, angio suites, and then you have an OR, and then this can work with or without a C, C arm. Or you can have also um, the same setup, but in addition, you have a true hybrid OR where you decide to plan cases in a hy hybrid OR where you have a fixed um, angiography system, um, either monoplane or biplane. Or you have a setup where you where you then would have no IR suites and have everything in the intraoperative setting as hybrid ORs. And this is kind of uh, so. If I go back here, the most common setup is probably A and B. C is very rare. Um, and I want to show you how how we kind of changed over time here at Penn. So so until 2016, we had the setup that we had two. Um, biplane angio suites um, in radiology and, and normal ORs where we use C arms for intraoperative um, uh, vascular imaging. And then in 2016, we, um, we acquired an artist Q hybrid OR, so a biplane. Um, and from, from, the, from that time on, we used for all our intraoperative, for all our open cases, we used that hybrid OR um, for intraoperative angiography but we still had our separate IR suites and also separate OR. So let's say a cavernous malformation, which doesn't need a um, hybrid OR would go in a regular OR. And then in 2021, in October, um, we switched from, from this setup to a true only hybrid OR setting with three Icono Siemens machines, where we would do all cases from now on in the operative setting. So, all diagnostic angiograms, all true only endovascular cases and all open cases are now in these rooms. So that, that was a big change to, to like the, the setup C. And that came across because we switched our whole service to a new hospital, the pavilion, as you can see here on the right side. So we moved from an older hospital to a new system. And there, um, the new concept was to streamline all the procedures. So instead of having separate IR suites, um, we we uh, incorporated them into the OR. So neuroradiology and neurosurgery share these rooms in the OR setting. And again, so three biplane Icona Siemens machines um, instead of having two biplane in the IR setting and one biplane intraoperatively. And if you think all the other stakeholders who are involved in, in cases in general, um, also a lot of things change. So anesthesia, for example, before they were present for, for all of our treatment cases, but for diagnostic angiograms, we usually did nursing sedation, not necessarily anesthesia. Now all the cases are in the introvert setting. So anesthesia is there for every case, for every diagnostic angiogram, they are doing the, um, the MAC um, or um, the sedation for the patients. So that's a big change. Also for the OR nurses who were only present for intraop cases and are usually OR, um, um, trained uh, nurses, they are now also present for all our cases, including endovascular treatments, um, angiography, knowing all of these um, details. And our techs, before we had separate techs, so in the OR, before were, the techs would also cover other procedures for x-ray techs, um, like spine, um, spine procedures, but now we have only one group of techs in the OR, and they're all neuro-IR techs. Um, and um, so that was also a big change. And that's kind of the setup now, because since it's in the OR, there's a red line and you can't cross this with street clothes. So for, for techs who worked for a long time in the IR space, um, it's a big change also for reps or for other people coming in, you always have to change. You have to make sure you're compliant. Um, and that kind of, you know, if you talk about challenges in the beginning, so when we started in October, 2021, that what we were very excited um, 
all the physicians and fellows who were very excited about this change with the opportunities of the new machines and new setup. But we quickly realized that there are also challenges and especially after a few months uh, into this new system, we, we really figured out that that there are really um, things we have to address. And because now, since there are more people involved with simple cases, there are different expectations between the different stakeholders. There was lack of experience and training because of, for example, OR nurses were not experienced with endovascular. The, the techs were not necessarily experienced being in the OR setup and having everything under the perioperative um, umbrella. So in, um, we realized that we had to be patient. And then for a while, we, we, we scheduled less cases to make sure it's um, we're in line and, um, and really talking about the big picture, what are the advantages and building really one team in the perioperative space. And that's that happened then after I would say six months um, that we really, although we had changes, there were um, a lot of people leaving, but we we built a new team, especially from the tech side, and um, we really standardized our procedure, which I truly believe is now really uh, perfectly set up, also for safety for the patients and for streamline. We have now morning huddles every morning to talk about all the cases schedule of the day. So anesthesia, nursing, techs, everybody knows what, what we're going to do. And then there are standardized sign outs, especially like phone sign out and, and documentation and epic and systems to make sure that everybody's aware since there are so many people involved. So this is our current setup. Um, we have three Icono biplanes on the left side. You can see OR 127. Um, it's also close to an intraoperative three Tesla MRI. So we're not using the MRI technology in addition to NGO right now, but um, there's an opportunity to bring a patient over here. Um, and then on the right side, we have OR 123 and 124 who are mirrored um, biplane Iconos. These, these rooms on the right side, we mainly use for endovascular procedures, but they're all completely equipped that we can always switch to an open procedure as needed. And the 127 is mainly for our open cases, or if you don't have an open case schedule, this is also an overflow for strokes or for endovascular procedures. And just an example for a ruptured aneurysm coming in, for example, in this in the setup, um, here the patient would come in, gets an angio in our biplane suites. If it's uh, if it looks like it's coilable, gets coiled. If it's wide neck, we may consider intrasecular device, or then switch to clipping. If appropriate, if it's more blister fusiform, you can do flow diversion in there or, or do other clip reconstruction or trapping with bypass. So it's really a one a one um, one uh, stop shop um, for the treatment of these cases. And then obviously case to case discussions if, if there's an in, emergent ICH or multiple aneurysms. And the most important thing is the patient leaves the room with like a biplane angiogram and we know everything is treated. So um, let me talk a little bit about the biplane and 3D interoperative angiogram as an adjunct for open surgery. So is the 3D really more useful in addition to a 2D like the C arm? And there was a really nice study uh, from, from Geisinger um, from, uh, as you can see here, um, 40, case, 40 cases where both 3D and 2D interoperative angiograms were obtained. And you can see that, especially in clipping, um, that really helped in 2.5% to change your surgical um, approach um, after clipping the 3D, which was not picked up by a 2D. In other procedures like AVMs, it didn't show like a big benefit. Um, also, the question is always what to use for uh, for access for your interoperative angiograms. Just a little um, detour here um, because we spent um, quite a time um, on this. So, so you can do trans transfemoral. Uh, um, access or also wrist access or what we recently also established trans probably a teal access for us, spinal fistulas for example and you can see here that we as as with all the angiograms we kind of switched more now to um, uh, wrist access for interoperative angiogram and and you can see also the uh, fluoroscopy and contrast use over time um, is less with all the approaches and the learning curve now with um, with radial is is much faster than the transfemoral as you can see here so a quick example for transpopular teal angiography, um, which we recently published. Um, so for spinal angiograms, it's really nice because then you don't have to tape your um, femoral sheath or use radial access. So it's pretty similar. You have also two options, as you can see here, right or left leg for, for the access. And, and with ultrasound sound guidance, you can, you can um, bring a regular five French short sheath um, in here. And 
So you just have to keep in mind that the distance is much longer, obviously, especially for the spinal catheters. Um, here, I, I had to use a vacant tip of 100 centimeter because it's, it was longer to reach the level. This was, I think, a, a, a T, T11 uh, dura bifistula. And, and then you can do your spinal angiogram um, interoperatively. Um, also, for more complex positioning, like prone, three quarter prone, or park, park bench position, um, this is a very nice um, review article um, uh, led by, by, by Juan. And you can see here in 26 studies with 142 patients, um, it actually showed that it is successful um, intraoperative angiogram in these positions and with a very low complication risk of um, 1%. And if you look at the surgical adjustment and revision um, for an intraoperative angiogram in these positions, 18%, which is really high. So it, it just highlights the use um, um, of these um, of the interoperative angiogram for these um, for these cases. A few case examples just to stay in the, in that in that theme. Um, for a three quarter prone position, here is a patient, fifty nine year old male patient with an incidental finding after head trauma um, with the stora avia fistula at the cranial cervical junction. Um, it's a um, straightforward um, open surgical case. Um, and you can see here, this is the positioning, um, three quarter prone position in the hybrid room. That's our older OR room with, um, before we moved into the new hospital. But you can see even a position, a challenging position like this is possible on an angio table with the arm um, 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 below the head, um, below the table. And um, you can see here with the radial descent. Um, Head, head holder, and also so it's on the right side. So here it's the most straightforward intraoperative angio axis is actually the right wrist. And here we use the right ulnar because it's pointing more towards us. And then um, a straightforward clip occlusion and, um, and obliteration of the fistula here. And then you can do, although it's obviously more challenging than other intraoperative angios, but you can get um, a nice view of an intraoperative angiogram to make sure that there are not additional feeders coming from from um, from other branches um, to this fistula. Um, I want to talk a little bit about aneurysm clipping, where it really helps us. Um, that's an um, interesting case. So it's a small blister-like aneurysm. As you can see here in the ACOM ruptured, um, challenging for intrasacular um, treatment endovascularly. Sure, you could do flow diversion or stent coiling, but in the ruptured setting, we're usually um, pro um, uh, trying to avoid this. So if, if intrasecular is not a good option, we usually clip these um, aneurysms. So here, um, as highlighted in, in Dr. Lawton's seven aneurysm book, um, I usually go for ruptured aneurysms on, on the dominant A1, which was on the left side here, and, and dissect my way to the aneurysm. Here in this scenario, as you can see, the aneurysm is pretty hidden. Um, Obviously, you could come from the contralateral side, but then you you, you hit the, the dome of the aneurysm right away, and you, you may see the A1 uh, for proximal, for temporary clipping quite late. So I usually come from that side and was fairly swollen here after um, arachnoid dissection. We got a lot of space, and you can see here the um, here the beginning of the A1 dissecting down, and, and that was kind of the view of the A1. Here's the aneurysm now um, pointing away from us. There's already a temporal clip on the A1. And here in this challenging scenario, I decided to do a, a fenestrate clip actually around the A1. Usually we do A1, A2 junction, but here um, around this, so you have to do a good dissection to make sure there are no perforators behind your clip. And um, you can see the clip blades closing, but you don't really know what's going on here in the back. So I see green is not really helping you. Um, and this is the intraoperative angiogram. So the 2D is also kind of challenging to see what, what's going on. And, and here really the 3D with reconstruction of your clip really highlights, especially the one when you look from the back that you got the aneurysm and you got a good result for the clipping. Um, and that was the post-op CT scan. Another case, um, um, similar aneurysm that was actually referred to us um, from an outside hospital directly for clipping because they weren't able to coil the aneurysm. So this was a scenario where we decided to go directly with clipping, um, although the aneurysm is definitely a little bit bigger and you can argue intrasecular um, coiling or maybe an intrasecular device would work here too. So here again, similar, similar um, dissection from the left side coming. Um, you can see the A1 coming in actually, but you 
again, the aneurysm is, is quite challenging, located, pointing away from us, as you can see here, just hit, hiding, and it's, it's uh, the A1 is actually moving pretty high up, very steep. So here I try to, um, to clip the aneurysm just with a kind of um, an angled clip, and that can be sometimes really challenging to really get the angle in the back. Um, fenestrated clip would have been here also a good idea, to be honest. And here in the intraoperative angiogram, you can see two things. First on the 2D on the left side, you can see first of all, there is spasm. So that's also always a, um, the angiogram highlights if there are um, spasm and the flow of the other vessels. But also on the TD, 2D, you see already that there is, is something here and confirmed on the 3D, you can see that there is definitely like a part of the aneurysm not incorporated in that clip. So here I we adjusted the clip, so I, I took a more angled clip, really pointing into the back end of the of the aneurysm, and then um, finished it with a straight kissing clip to that clip, and and that gave then a, um, a good result on the second intraoperative angiogram, and this was the one year follow up. So in some scenarios, either two D, but most of the time the three D helps you to to really see what's going on in in, in, in challenging locations for aneurysms. Um, Another um, uh, nice case um, where, where I think um, uh, the new technology really helps us is, is, is for AVM resection. So this is a, a patient who came to the ER, was previously resected at an outside hospital and presented now three months after the resection. So this, these were the initial pictures before resection in the outside hospital and presented now with a hemorrhage three months delayed. Um, so we're kind of suspicious that there may be something left in the cavity. Um, the angiogram looked on the first glance pretty clean. Um, the thing we saw was that the ACA, the still ACA branch, was still fairly large, which can be sometimes a hint that there may be something still going into that area. So um, with more um, microcatheter runs to, to find out what's going on, we actually saw that there is, there is an area um, where, um, where there's a little night is left. We didn't see an early draining vein, but it could be compressed by the hemorrhage right now. Um, and, and it kind of was confirmed by the microdyner CT. So this is a microdyner CT uh, through, the micro, through the catheter, microcatheter. Patient actually awake here. So you can see some movement artifacts and also the clip, uh, which was placed previously in the previous surgery is there. So a little bit of artifact, but really nice images you can see here to really highlight um, the relationship of the clip to the residual nidus, to the anatomy, to the old craniotomy flaps. So you can use these images really for, for your intravitive setting. So this was all done before the surgery. So on, an, on another day, we did the surgery. And what we can do here, since we didn't see the nidus on any MRI or CT scan, we did a CT, CTA pre-op, and then we could fuse that with our microdyner CT um, to really see intraoperatively where is that small portion of nidus to make sure that we really can get it. And this was um, here kind of like the integration of the CTA in the OR um, with the, the previously obtained microdyner. And then these are the intraoperative pictures. So this is the old clip here, the vein coming to the, the midline. And the nidus was kind of hidden here under the vein. Um, so probably left be behind um, behind that vein, and you can see it highlighted here in the fluorescein imaging. And then after resection of the nidus, um, you can see that we really were able to target that that specific location easily with the, with the Dyna CT. So the intraoperative pictures here we didn't do selective images, um, and then a, a follow up Dyna CT three months later, and it, angiogram showed um, showed um, good resection, and the patient recovered well. Um, so I think that's that's a really good case also to highlight what you can do with um, integration of imaging for your surgery. So if you talk about hybrid procedures now, um, the second part of the presentation, um, what is actually the definition? So I think about the definition that it's a case where you really um, incorporate both open surgical and endovascular techniques in the same procedure to really complete the treatment. And... Um, possible examples for these planned hybrid procedures, if you look into the aneurysm um, space, would be, for example, you, you plan a bypass followed by, let's say, an endovascular vessel takedown, or you plan a surgical clipping of a paraclinoid aneurysm, for example, if you, if you proceed, if you would do that, and, and then you plan already that you will, for example, have an um, endovascular balloon occlusion for temporary um, 
clipping in the carotid instead of doing a neck dissection. That could be, for example, a, um, a case. Or you have a patient with a ruptured um, aneurysm and a large hemorrhage or swelling, and, and you're going to the OR with a plan to evacuate the hemorrhage and coil the aneurysm or do a DHC and coil or, or clip, or you don't know, but like kind of combining this. Um, then for dural AV fistulas, obviously, it is useful to get a surgical approach to reach the fistula point or the pouch or vein when it's challenging for endovascular. Or for AVMs, you can think of like doing a combined embolization and resection, which I usually don't do because I wait to make sure a patient recovers after a stage embolization, but this is something you could think of potentially doing or other things. Um, so I think really, for hybrid procedures, the dura AV fistulas are really, really nice, um, a nice way, either with puncture or open surgery. These are two very cool cases and challenging cases presented by, uh, by my previous partner from Baylor, Dr. Kang, um, who, who really, um, uh, for these really challenging lesions, um, endovascular, so on the left side, um, that was a case still done at Baylor, um, where a transphenoidal approach was chosen uh, to insert um, a needle into that pouch followed by onyx embolization. And on the right side, that's a case um, he recently did at UTMB where, where he used a, um, a robotic system um, to do a, a small burr hole and um, transtemporal approach to reach um, a lateral pouch um, in the cavernous sinus for this uh, CC fistula or onyx embolization. Um, let me show you some case examples from us here at Penn. So this is a very interesting uh, case, a 63-year-old patient who came in with headaches and progressive nestic deficits for last year and, and had a seizure, which led to his admission. You can see he has a small left frontal hemorrhage and, um, and very significant cortical venous hypertension, as you can see here on the CT scan, and which also shows that the superior sagittal sinus was occluded. We had actually an MRI six weeks earlier because he, he complained about headaches before where you can see this um, um, hypertension cort uh, cortical vein um, cortical veins, um, but you see that the sinus is open at that time. So the sinus occluded over the last couple of weeks, um, which probably increased um, the pressure. Um, an angiogram actually highlighted that um, the patient had a pretty complex um, dural AV fistula um, fed by bilateral MMAs, STAs, occipital arteries, and also on the left side, an anterior etmoidal artery, and then also from um, right posterior meningeal artery. So everything went into this pouch, and you can see nicely the fusion of the two 3D um, spins here and the common carotid arteries, and the circle kind of highlights the, the common inflow of this fistula. If you look, I always look at the venous drainage of the dura if fistula versus, versus the drainage of the, the brain. And if you can see here, the dura if fistula actually in this injection drains um, uh, retrograde into the, um, the anterior portion of the superior sagittal sinus and then causes venous hypertension in the frontal lobe bilaterally. And it was really interesting when I saw the patient right before the treatment, he was uh, on, the, on the floor, he, he couldn't remember anything, he had really trouble finding words and, and communicate and, and was kind of really diffuse symptoms. And, um, and after the treatment, the next day, it, it really went away right away. So it was like an acute bifrontal hypertension. Um, here, when we look at the venous drainage of the brain parenchyma, you can see that actually the brain doesn't really use that sinus in the front and is draining more through deep system. And then, um, um, so it's not using the frontal portion. Here, the diner CTs pre-op highlight the same, same findings. See the complex st structure of these um, transosseous and the dural feeders into that, that sinus pouch and, and the occlusion of the sinus. So our idea was, since it was challenging to get an arterial approach here with multiple feeders, and the sinus was occluded, which was challenging to reopen and come from the back, especially since the whole segment was completely occluded, to do a small, um, small burr hole approach and then an endovascular um, coil occlusion of that sinus. So we brought the patient in, into our hybrid OR, that's the Icono hybrid OR. We did a radial access um, five French for roadmaps um, through the arm. And then we also prepped um, 
prepped the head of the frontal area where we where we would like to, to do the burr hole. And it's really nice. So we didn't use any navigation. Obviously, we know it's in the midline, but to really localize the point where we want to place our burr hole, we, we use the roadmap, which we acquired with the radio sheath. And then we just use the snap on the, on the live floor to really mark like, oh yeah, here, this is where we want to go in and, and then position the burr hole here, extend it a little bit more in the front to get a good angle to, to get back and, and, and place the six French radial sheath, just in case uh, we want, want to use more than one micro catheter or balloon assisted coiling or, um, these are the first runs, um, zoomed in over, over that segment of interest where we want to embolize, um, this is the placement of the sheath, as you can see here under the fluoro through the burr hole. And then um, once the sheath was placed, we pulled it back actually because we were actually too deep in there um, and, and then placed um, a headway dual microcatheter um, for coiling into that sinus and, and started, started coiling here. And we're able to form a really nice compact coil mass here, but not too many coils. Um, and, and that really um, showed a significant um, shutdown of, uh, of, of the fistula and after the four cords was completely occluded. You can still see the feeders, the large arterial feeders, but nothing is draining anymore. This was the final result. And then these, these are the final runs on the right side, common and external runs. You can see how the fistula is completely occluded and also on the left side. This was the closure just with gel foam and the titanium plate. And then this was the patient four weeks after. And he really improved right away after surgery, as I mentioned before, and, and uh, was neuro intact. So his follow-up angiogram is pending, but that was a really good result for this visit. Another quick case I want to show as a planned hybrid procedure. This is a very rare case, obviously for strokes, it's usually not necessary to plan a hybrid procedure. But um, this was a patient, young patient, um, significant um, um, medical history, um, was admitted um, with new strokes, bilateral cerebellar strokes. And you can see on the MRI, really significant cerebellar strokes already on, on the fusion weight imaging, and also a little hit in the, uh, in the pons, but not significant. And so, so this patient was a challenging situation. We talked for a long time with our stroke neurologist as well. Um, he needed, due to the swelling, he needed a decompressive craniectomy in the back, but he also had a subocclusive basilar uh, thrombus on the tip of the basilar. So the question was, can we remove that clot and then also proceed with the DHC um, either to follow or in our scenario, since we have a hybrid OR to do it in one room, because the thinking process was if we would leave the subocclusive clot, he would need to be heparinized, but undergoing an open procedure, then post-op is a higher risk for bleeding. So um, we decided it makes sense here to actually remove the subocclusive clot first and then do the DHC. So we brought the patient into the hybrid room and we it, it was a pretty big patient. And we first thought, okay, we can quickly do the thrombectomy and then we, we turn him around. Um, but then we would need to reposition him on a different bed and then position him for the DHC. So here in this scenario, we actually decided to... Um, quickly place a radial sheath, the left vertebral artery was the dominant artery in the bed. Once that was positioned, we positioned him prone in the hybrid, hybrid OR, flipped him to prone and positioned him, the head pretty straight at that point, but in the radiolucent Mayfield. And then we proceeded quickly with the thrombectomy and prone position, as you can see here with the, with the radial long sheath and a wrist um, went, went up. So it's now the opposite, right? We're looking, uh, the patient is in prone position. so. So this is the, um, the left vertebral artery going up. And then this was the sub subocclusive clot up here. There was also a stenosis in the VB junction, which we left alone. And that was the clot we retrieved um, for the prone thrombectomy. And then followed by, by, by then flexing the head a little bit more, but being already in that position and then ready for, um, for the de uh, decompressive hemicraniectomy. The nice thing is also, um, you can proceed with like a dyno CT then on the table quickly a CT scan to make sure there's no hemorrhage and then also to to plan your your bony um, decompression and and after the decompression you can really see like um, 
the, the success you had with your decompression or if you need more. And then you can also look at um, at CT scans then. This is also from based on the Dyna CT. So that was that's that's obviously a rare case, but something to think about, um, especially more more ca uh, more cases, opportunities we have in the future. Um, aneurysm hybrid procedure, that's another case. Um, this is a, a young lady who had um, pretty rapid ICH um, progression, clinically declining with a challenging ophthalmic aneurysm. And you can see the blab really pointing into that hemorrhage up top. So challenging to really go in and clip that aneurysm without further dissection. Um, and so here in this case, we really plan to go to the OR, um, do a DHC, try to call the aneurysm, and then go in and take the hemorrhage out and inspect. So here we, we started with the DHC, it was pretty significantly swollen, then quickly secured the aneurysm with coils on the hybrid table and then took out the ICH. Here it was, um, after we took the ICH out, it was actually not swollen at all. So we actually put the bone back in in a specific scenario. And, and these were the kind of the six month follow-up angiogram and CT scan. So that's, that's, that's also, um, I think you can do for aneurysm, especially um, where you can combine um, decompression evacuation with, with endovascular treatment. So let me um, go into the last part kind of into unplanned hybrid procedures with conversion. So first, um, procedures where we started endovascular and then, um, and then changed to open. Um, there are possible examples um, for this unplanned conversion to hybrid procedures. So for example, an incomplete coiling, you would go to clipping, you try to coil, it doesn't work, you go to clipping. Or um, a case where you do clipping and you, you can, can imagine something happens and, and you need like an intervention, for example, thrombectomy endovascular. Or, um, or you could also think about you have a failed thrombectomy and you do an uh, urgent bypass. In this scenario, I usually re-image to make sure that there's still salvageable brain afterwards um, before we decide to do a, um, an urgent bypass. Um, or for example, for also for tandem lesion where you could combine um, um, the treatment options. So here, um, that's a case where uh, with a ruptured aneurysm looks looks a good looks looks a favorable case for coiling actually but if you look more at the 3d you can see there is there is an additional wide neck portion with an additional blab so it makes it really really wide neck so kind of challenging for for just intrasecular if you don't want to add a um, add a stand i gave it a shot anyway so here um is is the coiling the first coil went actually in well but then despite having a balloon up i, I don't have the pictures where the balloon is up but um, trying with the next coil, the coil wouldn't wouldn't stay in there even with the balloon up, and it was kind of challenging to really address like the the proximal portion of the neck without dropping a stent. Um, and here in this case, so I decided you you can actually see it much better here. There's like in the back, there's this other additional lobe, and then all of this is like wide neck. So um, here I decided to to change over to open um, pretty swollen brain as you can see here and interestingly also you can see this was just a few minutes before coiling that the coil is actually not necessary in the aneurysm you can see it on the angiogram it looks in the dome but sometimes the rupture side can be really um, really open to subarachnoid space so sometimes I feel like when we coil that the coils are not necessarily always in the aneurysm they can be also floating a little bit or plugging. But here, the nice thing was this one coil actually helped me to, to secure the rupture point. So it didn't bleed when, when I when I went back in, but I, I saw the coil. And then I just placed a, um, a curved clip on top. And these are the interoperative imaging, kind of showing the complete occlusion with a one-year follow-up with good result. Um, another case, so I want to um, highlight this. This is a case by my partner, Dr. Shonavasan. Um, it's it's a challenging um, tandem occlusion, a 79 year old patient uh, with an acute occlusion of a previously like stenotic uh, left carotid artery. Um, he tried all tricks to to reaccess and open that up um, from an endovascular perspective, but that was challenging. You can see also like these different channels here, so very challenging um, to open this. And so he decided to switch in the angio suite. You can see that. Um, into um, a CEA procedure to, to reopen the carotid. So that's what he's doing right now here. This is the plaque, really nice dissection, and then closed up the neck, 
and and then since the neck was open you can argue you can also go back through the leg but since it was already open under under visualization so he placed a, a radial sheath here and then through the sheath did a run and now found that so carotid is wide open now of the CA and um, but you see the distal occlusion of the carotid and then he did a thrombectomy first to reopen the the, the ICA occlusion and then a few steps um, addressing the M2 occlusion which was there before um, before starting the case so reopening kind of the the M2 and and two more passes with the stent retriever as well with a good result so that's that's a nice case so in case you struggle with thrombectomy you can switch to CDA in the same procedure followed by then um, chasing the clot distally um, let me show you a few examples for endovascular bailout when you start a microsurgical procedure. So this is also a case by, by my partner, Dr. Shunavasan. Um, it's a ruptured aneurysm. He initially coiled with a very good result. As you can see here, complete occlusion, um, balloon-assisted coiling. And then on, on, on early follow-up angiogram, so we usually do um, follow-up angiogram in the ruptured cases after seven to 10 days, just to make sure. Um, and you can see a, a, a recurrent aneurysm here. He attempted to recoil, which was challenging. So then he decided to um, to do um, a clipping, which I think is very reasonable, given that early recurrency. Um, I'm always worried about like putting more coils in. If it failed now, why why should it then last the next time? So I think it's a very good idea in these cases to then um, uh, change the modality to clipping. This was the interoperative view. You can see here kind of the coil mass, and then here the new aneurysm formation within 10 days here. So he did a really nice job clipping that here, complete occlusion. But on the intraoperative angiogram, you can see that the A1 is, is occluded here. Um, and so by seeing this, although the, the IC green looked good, the vessel was closed and the Doppler, as I remember, was, um, was, was also um, fine. He, um, he already saw that in the intraoperative angiogram and could intervene at, at the same time. And, and with like a nice um, aspiration pass, he could open that vessel nicely. So, so that's, that's really a, a beautiful adjunct that you can uh, convert quickly to a treatment. Um, here, a recent case from, for me, a bypass patient, um, a young lady, classic Moya Moya bilateral disease, progressive disease. I, I previously did an, a left-sided direct indirect bypass construct, also with door inversion. Um, the great result, and then she, she presented now with a progression on the right side. So here, um, I decided to do also, um, obviously, a right-sided bypass um, with a very large STA, as you can see here on the lateral side. Uneventful case. I usually dissect both branches out, as you can see here, the posterior branch and uh, the anterior branch, and use that for a direct bypass here already laid up, and then um, leave the other branches in indirect, and then in addition, a dural inversion, as you can see here. So this was the bypass, was uncomplicated. Um, and the final result, you can see this is the direct bypass and the indirect bypass going here on the side. Um, the the IC green and flow 800 look great. You can see the flow coming in, filling that area early. The indirect bypass not filling much. I see that sometimes because the flow demand is much higher for the direct, but over time it may pick up. So I, I in some cases you see both filling at the same time. Sometimes you see um, just the direct um, filling. So um, I'm usually not worried when I don't see the indirect as long as the direct is filling right away. But the intraoperative angiogram was interesting. So the whole proximal portion of the STA was actually completely spasmed out, which was not really like indicated by the IC green because we saw the anastomosis was open. So here in this case, I, I decided to, with the diagnostic catheter being in the external carotid, to, to give some rapamil and, and uh, improve that flow. So it's it's a nice adjunct if you, because I'm doing all my angi angiograms for bypasses as well to confirm and if I see something there, you can intervene. So it's it's an additional um, help. Other um, thoughts are, this is a, a case report. We published it at Baylor. It's not an intraoperative case, but you can also think that potentially do angioplasty um, to increase the flow for, 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 for the bypass in case you see a stenosis. But this was also another paper um, um, published at, at, um, at Baylor for a pediatric case. Um, uh, where Dr. Lamb was doing a, a direct anastomosis for um, for a fusiform MCA aneurysm, and then 
um, post procedure in a, or in an interop angio, um, we saw that there was a dissection of the STA and um, Dr. Kahn during that time was, was placing a stent to reopen the vessel because the anastomosis was open, but it was just a proximal portion. So there, there are all these, these additional things you can think about um, when you have the opportunity to intervene during an, an open or endovascular case or vice versa. So um, these were all the cases I presented. Um, I, I kind of want to summarize and open up the discussion. Um, so I, I really think that the transition to a biplane interoperative um, hybrid setup really opens new opportunities. As I mentioned in the beginning, it, it really, you need to prepare the whole team for this transition and you, be, you need to be very inclusive because there are a lot of changes. But once it's up and running, it's very easy to switch between open and endovascular because the whole team is used to endovascular or open. So they can just like open a set and everybody knows what's going on. So it's not a surprise. Um, and I really think it's a one-stop shop for cerebrovascular cases, really useful. Um, and and there, as I highlighted in my presentation, there are different scenarios. So you could think about with the setup, you have endovascular only. We can do op open only and use the biplane as an intraop angio, or you do pl plant hybrid cases or unplanned hybrid cases. So thank you again for having me. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Burkhardt, for that excellent talk. I'm going to search the chat room as well as uh, allow Dr. Monteith, who has his hand raised, to ask some questions. Thanks, John Carl. That was uh, that was a great uh, great talk and uh, a topic that's uh, close to my heart. Um, coming coming here ten years ago, we just started doing interoperative angiography with the Zigo system, um, and so we have a, a, a single plane and a biplane, and we found that the the single plane I don't use as much anymore, um, but there are some benefits to the single plane setup. Um, for instance, uh, doing uh, so the Dallas maneuver endovascularly, we've we've done that for giant aneurysms. Uh, you can have one person uh, aspirating and, and sucking down the um, the aneurysm while the operating uh, microscope is uh, uh, easier to get in and out. Uh, rather than our biplane room, you have to turn 90 degrees. Do you guys have to turn 90 degrees uh, to get away from the base in your biplane room, or uh, do you have a mechanism where uh, you don't have to turn the bed? Um, we don't necessarily have to turn the bed. It gives us a little bit more space for, for the open part that we turn the bed a little bit, but we can potentially stay straight and we can also just use the single plane if we if we think the biplane is in the way and just use the single and and turn turn that. Um, but I agree. I mean, it gives us more space for the open case if we turn the table a little bit. Yeah, what, one uh, comment um, for for intraoperative angio for AVMs, we often would use the single plane for the reasons that you mentioned, getting the the lateral and uh, with our anesthetic setup can be a challenge. I, I've sometimes found that having uh, two aneurysm clips or AVM clips in the field where you've done the surgery, you, you might not have needed clips to take the AVM out. But if you're trying to localize where the residual is, particularly if the patient's head is rotated in, in some funky position, like three quarter prone or something like that, um, having the uh, couple of aneurysm clips to triangulate where your residual is um, can be pretty helpful. Um, we definitely use it for, for ACOMs. Um, I think it's really helpful. I'm curious, um, we used to do intraoperative angio on every single case. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the way I was trained at Jeff. Um, with MCAs, we tend to be doing it a little bit more selectively. And I know you've got an MCA clipping you're doing today. Do you routinely uh, do intraop angio for, uh, you know, a simple, small MCA that you can see the branches on, or have you become kind of more selective, um, you know, as you got more experience? Um, I do it for every case, but the main reason is that when the patient gets out of the room, I know the aneurysm completely occluded. And then the next time I do an angiogram for a clip, so I would do then just a CTA, for example, in a year, but then would repeat a catheter angiogram in like three to five years if it's an unruptured aneurysm. But if I, if I don't do the intraoperative angiogram, I don't have a angiography evidence that I treated the aneurysm, then the patient would require like um, a couple of days later a diagnostic angiogram. Because I wanna I wanna have 
I'm, I'm a true believer that even for clipping, I, I want to have an angiogram to make sure everything looks good. And, and then when the patient is asleep, I, I think it's so much easier to quickly do it then with, yeah. with our setup of like a biplane, if it would be a C arm, then it would be different. I think then I would probably not, would it do it only in like selective cases and then get a proper angiogram after. But for us, the proper angiogram is the same intra op or post op. So even with the I think, position. I think it's really yeah, helpful. You know, these ruptured cases, um, we take straight to our hybrid hybrid room for the same reason. You know, you might start out thinking into a coil and then if you need to transition, um, you know, it's it's super easy. Uh, the other one that we've been uh, using it for is the uh, MMA, EMBO and Burr holes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're part of the STEM trial um, and for patients that were uh, randomized to the, to the endovascular and surgical treatment, we just found that was the easiest way to uh, to get everything taken care of. So that and, and T cars is another example. Um, uh, I think you know these rooms are just fantastic. And um, just to finally uh, reiterate your comment, the um, learning curve when you start doing these, if you're if you're at a place that hasn't done it, the first half a dozen are brutal. Um, and the especially prone cases or three quarter prone cases can be very challenging for the teams, but stick at it for uh, those people out there that are just starting to do intraoperative angio. If you stick at it after about 10 or, or 20, if you do it every case like jean is talking about, then I think it really is a, a useful adjunct. Um, so some really great cases and I'll, I'll yield my time so someone else can uh, ask some questions. Uh, yeah, also, I'd love to say, like, the MMA EMBO is really a good one. Um, I should have included also a case on this, but yeah, that, that's that's really a cool procedure where you can do both at the same time. Uh, uh, in some of the literature, again, uh, definitely talk about the benefits of it, but one question asked by uh, one of our viewers is just the cost effectiveness um, as well for all open cases in doing uh, um, uh, using a hybrid room. Yeah. So for us, as, since since it's integrated for, so we only have hybrid rooms, right? So all our angiography procedures are in these rooms. So from the cost standpoint, it's actually for us, it's 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 probably less expensive because we do it in the same procedure. Um, the angiogram, instead of doing the next day in the same room, we would do an angiogram then. So we, we, we do it all at the same time. Um, so it's kind of streamlined. It also saved a lot of costs in, in terms of people working in that space, because we have only one tech team now. We don't have specialized techs for the OR or the IR. We don't have separate nurses for IR and OR. And um, so it's all it's all in one space. Um, that's at least my understanding. And then uh, could you elaborate a little bit more regarding, as you said, the popliteal? I know you guys just published that paper uh, uh, regarding that uh, access. Yeah, I mean, some of these procedures. I mean, we don't have that much experience, but I, I think it's a nice, it's a nice um, approach. Um, I know that body IR is using that anyways for for their procedure, so it's a well established access. And with ultrasound, it's it's really easy to puncture. Um, I would just say, like, we only hold compression. I, I don't use a closure device in that area, so that's that's important to know. And and also the the length of the catheter, you have to be to make sure, especially when you when you treat a lesion like in the higher thoracic, the, the, the usual length of our spinal catheters may not reach. Um, so also, I mean, like um, most of the people don't necessarily do intraoperative angiograms for spinal fistulas, right? Because I mean, usually the, the IC green and um, is, is beneficial too for these lesions. But again, it comes back to the same thing. We would then do a post-op angiogram, spinal angiogram, and since we have it already in the room, so we're quickly doing um, the levels two up, two down intraoperatively, and then we're done. And then um, it's also time saving for us, and we don't have to schedule that case post-op. So, um, so that helps us. Yeah, that's that's how we do it too, jean carl Even for a type one dural fistula, I'll, I'll still do an angio for the same reasons. I think it's. It's straightforward. Um, you know, I, I, I've traditionally done it just through the leg with a an armored arrow sheath and taped it around the leg. Um, my senior colleague, Dr. McDougall, uh, did the popliteal stuff like 20 years ago or something. So uh, yeah. occasionally, you know, he might do that. But um, I think one of the challenges with the with the prone angios for spinal, at least, sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to form the catheters. I found because you you lack that talkability. 
um, that can be a bit of a challenge. You know, if you're if you're starting out, um, that can be a difficulty with any uh, prone angiogram. I think is the talkability of the catheters, as well as as you quite rightly pointed out, sometimes the the catheters um, uh, you run out of length. If uh, if you've got a very large patient who's wrapped the sheath around the leg, there's a whole lot of little nuances to prone angiography. Are there any other questions by any of the other panelists or hosts? I'm just uh, putting it out there. Uh, there's, a, there's a question in the chat, which is a good one, um, talking about anticoagulants or anti-aggregant or antiplatelet medications. Um, I think that's a great question. You know, there was that uh, interesting case you, you mentioned there with the, the stent for the bypass that was going down. Um, you know, I'm curious, uh, you know, what they did in terms of antiplatelet medication. Um, you know, if, if we do a radial angio, we'll give um, like 3,000 units of heparin or something, but if it's femoral, we won't typically give um, heparin if I've got the head open. How do you deal with that, John Carl? Yeah, so for, for all our intraop angios, we usually, um, so for the radial cocktail, if you go wrist for intraop, we usually don't give the heparin, as you mentioned. Um, and we connect our sheath then to an A-line for anesthesia. So there's no flush line on it. So the A-line can, so you can use that as an A-line. So um, so that's useful for, for the catheters. When we do our angio, I usually, I'm so I'm trained to have a flush line on all my catheters. So there is heparin in there. And I think that's fine. I actually for bypasses, sometimes if we don't have an A-line set up, I just put it, put the sheath on a flush line. And and that's heparinized saline, and I let it drip very very slowly. It um, some pe some some people even give heparin anyways during bypasses, so I think that's fine. Um, I'm not super worried about the heparin necessarily, but um, we try to just use an as use an A line. And then for the more complex cases, obviously with the stenting and an open procedure, I can't remember actually what 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 we did. This is a, quite a while ago, but um, I think um, we loaded then. Um, with, I, I'm not sure if it was Berlinta, despite the fact it was an open procedure, just to, to keep the stand open. Uh, yeah, interesting, you're, you're doing the, the interoperative angios for, for Moya Moya. You know, I, I haven't been doing that. Um, you know, that case that you showed uh, kind of challenges my own sort of dogma on that. Um, you know, uh, the, the ICG we found to be pretty helpful um, and, and Doppler as well, but um, that spasm that you sometimes see from the temporary clipping of the of the donor is a real thing, and and sometimes you can see it on the ICG, but sometimes you can't. And I think that angiogram was sort of an interesting, um, you know, an interesting example. Have you seen that many times, or is that kind of a, an unusual example? Um, that's a very unusual example. Um, since I do it now for all my bypasses, I, the the advantage of doing the angiogram is, in my perspective, that you can really see if if I mean the anastomosis you can see on the surface, but I really want to see that the branch is going down to the bifurcation and fills the other lobe, for example. So that's what you can really see on the AP angiogram, which which is challenging on the IC green. Obviously, you can see on the surface that the temporal lobe is maybe also um, lighting up earlier, but but that's a good thing. And then also I had a case, actually a complication where, where I plugged in a bypass into, into an area which where the vessels were more on the lower flow side. And I could see it was almost like I, I created a fistula or kind of like getting into like um, into parenchyma or more capillary system. During that time, I didn't really know what to do with it because I I, I've i never seen that before. And since nobody's really doing these angios, and I left it. And unfortunately, the patient had like a delayed hemorrhage. And so looking back at that case, I learned from this, like if I would see that again, where the direct bypass wide open, but gets more into like capillary system rather than filling um, a real territory, that would be also something where I would probably now, if I see that again, I would probably actively take down that bypass and just rely on an indirect bypass at that point so i think there are there are a lot of um things you can do um, the more information you get yeah i think that's a, it's a good point you know you, you build up this experience and you know when when something looks normal and then uh when you see something abnormal you might do something different i think that's all the all the questions uh we have and uh we know you've got a uh, a patient that uh yeah, they're probably just getting ready for you today. So Jean-Carl, we want to thank you again 
Uh, great to see you uh, again and um, great talk. As I said, it's a, a topic that is um, very passionate about and you have to drag some people along the way sometimes to, to have that passion, but Entropive Angio is you know, super helpful and that was a real uh, tour de force of, uh, of cases and and um, and data points on, on how useful this is. And we really appreciate you taking the time out to uh, spend it with us this morning. Great, thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you.